guys. I'm not sure what's going on here, to be completely honest. Um, I knew I was going to be the last speaker, so I assumed it would be Linnea and I, and maybe like Nick Jensen, because he's into Jewel Flowers, and Rob Preston would hang around kindly for me. Um, and so I thought I'd just bring a Jewel Flower for us, and we just kind of sit around and botanize it in here in the front row. So I really appreciate you guys hanging out for this uh, last good news. But to be honest with you, the good news for me, is that NorCal Botany is alive and well, right? Yeah. Now, let, let's see, uh, although, you can see this down there, Sam? Yeah. Yeah, what color are the flowers? Yeah, yeah so this is not going to work very well, I appreciate that. Let's see if our tech works, I apologize here for a second. Hey, dude. <laughs> Can you make out the pillowy, inflated sepals? Yes. In white, primarily. And then the ribbony petals? Yeah, we can move out a little bit. The ribbony petals do a lot less to the show. I'm going to talk repeatedly about the sepal color, so I want to make sure you can see that in the Metcalf Canyon Jewel Flower. And I would be remiss without showing you. Oh, we'll wait for it a little bit later to see some other remarkable things about jewel flowers. But the majority of the show is done. Hey, Hugh, let's switch back over to the slideshow when you're available. Thanks. <laughs> the majority of the show of the jewel flowers is done by the sepals, and the sepal coloration turns out to be important in a lot of the groups. And the Metcalf Canyon jewel flower is renowned for having uh, white ones. I'd like to tell you uh, some more good news which is our new occurrence that we found and some reintroduction results at Tulare Hill on the Metcalf Canyon Jewel Flower. And then to leave even gooder news from Streptanthus albinus associates to Paramoenus, or whatever the right name is, a little bit of history of that problem, some geographic information. Uh, I, we did some experiments on pollinators and some molecular data. And so I apologize, but both for me and you guys, this is gonna be filled with all sorts of grass and dendrograms and trees and whatnot, when I have all the credit, to, I mean, all the uh, appreciation in the world for you being able to speak without such things. All right. The Metcalf Canyon June Flower is just that. It is relatively rare along Metcalf Road and to a couple areas north of that on Coyote Ridge. We're in southern Santa Clara County, and here is San Jose to the north and Morgan Hill to the south, and you may recognize Highway 101 along here. The white dots here are the six or seven extant sites that we verified as of just a couple of months ago. Um, there are unfortunately some extirpated sites in red and some misidentified um, ones. In particular, these guys on the southern edge of Coyote Ridge, this is Coyote Ridge uh, along here, are most likely not white sepal, and that would be a mystery for the second half of the talk. But uh, let me first tell you about our new occurrence that we found over here off of Hellier Road, off 101. It's, I hope, a little inspiring to the young people and some of us old timers as well to see that right there in southern Santa Clara County, this is the Silicon Valley where thousands of cars are going by per hour, possibly. There was Metcalf Canyon Jewel Flower right on this orb-shaped serpentine road cut, maybe being fed by seeds from up above, although too much private land restricted us from doing too much illegal trespassing up there, but we definitely <laughs> have a hint that there may be some sea range from up above, we'll say, but the occurrence, of course, is only along that uh, road cut. But there are at least 250 plants there, and there have been 250 plants for the last two to three years, and the majority of them are reproductive, and it seems like people are staying off of it. So that's pretty exciting because we just went from six to seven known occurrences of a pure white sequel population. 
Thank you. Uh, it was mostly the work I should mention of uh, Aaron Tong, who's an undergraduate helper for myself. It'll be as we were driving by, I said, hey, we should stop there. And Crystal Nieder with Creekside, and she works with Stu Weiss, and uh, all of them have been very essential in most of this work. I'll talk more about them later. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the reintroduction that we've been working on. The reintroduction at Tulare Hill, this is right adjacent to this extirpated site. Um, this would bring a pure white population from the west side, the east side of 101 over to the west side of 101, uh, particularly at uh, the largest population, which is Metcalf Road. It provides some uh, long-term stability, we hope, in that way. This is what Tulare Hill looks like uh, from the south, looking north in the late fall. And you'll see some power lines run over the top, the Metcalf Energy Center there. And this is the Coyote Valley, which was thankfully saved from development. But at the same time, because the predominant wind direction is north to south, a large amount of nitrogen is being deposited in the serpentine grassland. The majority of those plants are adapted to low nitrogen uh, inputs. And Stu Weiss has done an amazing job at not only documenting that, but then introducing management protocols that uh, he would do a much better job at explaining than I can. We've now also been exposed to quite a bit more recently of uh, fire retardant, which turns out to be mostly nitrogen. Uh, although that's going to be local and maybe temporary, it is something on our radar and uh, it would be interesting to know if anybody's familiar with that. But we were on top of Tulare Hill planting plants thanks to some very generous CNPS members, some Santa Clara undergraduates. In fact, this is becoming a. Uh, I'm sure you'd say. Steve there, two talks in a row with a very generous CNPS uh, member. We collected and cleaned and then sorted jewel flower seeds for our reintroduction. They were started as a captive breeding population. I actually had to get a permit to maintain a captive breeding population of jewel flowers. And you can see the captivity, right? They're definitely <laughs> not going anywhere. Uh, thankfully, we had great success. Didn't lose too many of them to wandering or any predation, but uh, we waited for the first rains, and that was 2014, and we waited all late fall and into winter, and we kept waiting and waiting, and 2014 became 2015, and we were just waiting for that first rain because we didn't want to put seeds out and dry, and then now it's January, and we're still waiting, and we're wondering if we're doing the right thing, and then it was February, and we finally decided to plant, and it surely rained that day, thankfully, but unfortunately, the plants didn't get an overwintering, and only a dozen plants came up that spring, and we were sure this was the biggest flop ever. Thankfully, there's a nice seed bank, unlike in the wallflowers, the jewel flower seed bank lasts a long time. We've got at least seven or eight-year-old seeds to germinate from the lab, and we now know in the field that those will last at least five years. So here's a little bit of the data from 2015. Uh, after the seeds had sat for a whole year in the ground, they got a nice overwinter vernalization, and then we went and surveyed them. We had four pots at, four spots at Tulare Hill. Half of them were grazed and half of them were ungrazed. That is, there's cattle up there quite consistently, and that's helping manage some of the introduced grasses, and the timing of that turns out to be important. Um, although there's a lot of numbers here, this is how many showed up in the December after the good rain, and you'll see there are automatically, right from the get-go, always more uh, germinants in the ungrazed than in the grazed plots. But overall we had some almost 5,000 plants show up at the beginning. Now the numbers can only go down at this point, just to warn you. The good news is that not that many um, disappeared between December and March. Uh, we ended up losing about 30 uh, percent. Then there was a modest loss. We're now down to uh, about 60 percent of that number, but we still have now over a thousand plants um, and the exciting thing is that they made a lot of fruits. The saliques were plentiful. So we ended up with about the similar order of magnitude saliques as we did seeds removed from the seed bank, is how we think of it. If 4,733 plants emerged, then those seeds are no longer there. But we replaced it with 4,050 saliques. And each one of those saliques has 30 seeds, give or take a few. So therefore, we're 30 times up in my calculations. That was good news. That's that where I'd like to hone in. I'm glad to talk about the rest of those numbers 
Um, but there's definitely an effect of grazing, uh, and we think that that has something to do with the grazing that happened during the interim year when the seeds were in there. Either they were disturbed by the cattle roaming around, or the habitat had changed enough such that the spots inside of the enclosures were actually more amenable to germination than the sites outside. Interestingly, those 4,050 siliques that we produced up on Tulare Hill were not equally distributed. Most of the siliques look like this. Most of the plants in fruit testences look something like this with maybe three or four or five. And then occasionally you get these real sports with 15, 20, 30, if you can follow the pointer here, there are 39 siliques on this particular plant. Uh, Stu helped me with a little graph here, and it indicates the sweepstakes approach to reproduction of these plants. These are the percent of all the plots that we created, and this is the percent of all the fruits, so this would be that 4,050 number. And you see that quickly we can get some 4% of the plots creating 50% of the seeds. 1 20th of all the plots to just get half the number of seeds. 10% of the plots generated about 75% of the seeds, and you can get 90% of those seeds out of just 16% of the plots. And this may not be uncommon. I'm not as familiar with this literature as you guys may be. But it really hit me that the, this is a sweepstakes approach. And if we could figure out how to find those 16% of plots, boy, we could do a lot better. But we tried and tried and tried with all the possible covariates that we could come up with, and nothing came up significant. And there is something happening at the micro environment scale that we have yet to identify. And I, I credit my colleagues for having looked really hard for those, and it's just uh, not immediately obvious. Okay, that is the reintroduction success so far. Oh, I, last note on that. As of May 2019, we still had 1,000 plants. And the exciting thing is that half of those plants are not even in our plots. That is, the plants are clearly spreading and they're annuals, then they're continuing their reintroduction success. So um, we, we feel pretty good about that. We're gonna continue monitoring. Um, and if the tides are correct, we may even put some more seeds and plants out there. Well, let me tell you about the really good news here, uh, which is some new results that we have for uh, close relative Sertanthus albidus, subspecies Carolinus, and if uh, everything goes right, I brought one of those too, because I would be remiss in just showing you one of them. So this is Sertanthus albidus Carolinus or Sertanthus glandulosus, depending on whose treatment you follow. Now, Sertanthus albidus Carolinus is a um, critically uh, protected species. Sertanthus glandulosus is a very common jewel flower. This is a little bit troublesome. Um, depending on the treatment. So let me take you through a little bit of the history of the treatment, show you some new results. Here's our Kirkberg, who did some of the uh, really great early work on this. In fact, uh, he crossed regular glandulosis, which has a dark purple sepal, with some albidus, and that includes albidus albidus and albidus paramoinus, the light pink one. And these are all completely interfertile, but had strong barriers to reproduction with glandulosis. So that suggests that there may be some reproductive isolation there. We've done some uh, flower color work, and you'll see more of that in a second. So that's the white one on the top, the slightly pink, although it's really much pinker than that, and then the dark purple glandulosis. And now, um, I love Mike Meyer and uh, Bessetta and their paper in 2010, and it rehashed some ITS sequence data and some chloroplast restriction site data. There's very little new data, just the taxonomic treatment so that they could make a statement. And down here is what's called the southern plate of glandulosis, and this is this big glandulosis complex that's all over the sort of central and northern part of California. I want to hone in on this southern clade. Their ITS quickly picks up a strong signal for a group of plants that grow in the southern portion of the range, particularly in this area. And this is where Coyote Ridge is, for example. Yet they're talking about one or two ITS differences, no chloroplast differences, in this little group here. And you'll see that some paramoinus shows up here, and then there's another paramoinus here. And there's one ITS difference that shows that makes this separate from that. And I've seen too many of these trees in other groups and other jewel flower groups and other wallflower groups and other columbines to put much weight on that. But that was enough of a treatment for them to switch paramoinus from a taxon as a subspecies level, which allowed it protection, to submerged with glandulosis, which suddenly removed its protection or would have removed protection 
uh, Aaron Sims not, uh, you know, really gone out of his way to kind of communicate with me and help keep that on the list for now. Taking things off lists, it seems like you need a lot of evidence to get something on a list. I think you need even more evidence to take it off of a list. So something to remove protections, we want to be really sure about that. And I wish there was more data, and I would be excited to say, okay, there's enough data here, let's remove from the list. But the data is the same as it's been for the last 10 or 15 years from Myers' work. So let's talk about some new data really quickly. I was really hoping that Evil Lucacho and Sharon Strauss down at Davis would solve this. So they did this beautiful uh, study of jewel flowers and they built this beautiful tree with a whole bunch of genes and lots of variation and almost all the branches are resolved and I was sure and then I found the glandulosis complex. Can you see it in there? Yeah, that's it right there. Yeah, this triangle, by the way, it means I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's, a, it's this phylogenetics way of saying WTF, anyways. <laughs> that didn't help. But let me tell you a little about, about the geography and then some of our other work and then uh, we'll wrap up. So the geography is pretty clear. Uh, Albinus Albinus is only in the northern portion of the uh, Coyote Ridge and it's only found there, all pure white sequel plants. So you might say it looks something like that to be uh, non-polygonish. But the Paramoanus plants are clearly to the south of that, with a little bit of overlap, which causes some gray area problems. And there are some pictures I took, I know it's a little washed out, but everything from this point down southward is light pink, and everything from this point northward is pure white. Now, I wanted to introduce you to Coyote Ridge, and I wish I had a lot more time to show you all the amazing things that, that I see out there, but Stu Weiss, uh, one of my colleagues, said, uh, if you put this picture in here, your talk will be quantitatively better than it would without it. So there you go. Apparently there's a butterfly that lives out there that some people care about. <laughs> Although this one's a little pornographic for me, so let's move on. <laughs> Do these things have any reproductive isolation? Let's look a little bit at some neutral markers and then talk about pollinator preferences. Uh, we looked throughout the genome at 635 of these AFLP markers, and I can explain what that means, but it's effectively just a snapshot of little spots in the genome that either have or don't have the marker. And you shouldn't be able to read any of this, so I'll give you a little key here. There's all the white ones, and those are most of the pink ones, and then these are the dark purple ones that are streptanthus glandulosa. So that was pretty exciting. Unfortunately, I marked the bootstrap values that are above 70, which is kind of 75, which is kind of a 95% confidence, and there are not very many of them. So it's, although encouraging, not completely resolved, and there are these asterisks, which is a paramoinus that falls in the middle of albidus albidus, and then another albidus over here with paramoinus, and a couple of exceptions. Those asterisks are the non-reciprocally monophyletic portions. That just means the ones that are misbehaving, so to speak. The arrow is indicating what might be the unique white lineage if, uh, barring some exceptions. So we had some encouraging results, but that's not 100%, and that's kind of what we want to do before we make these big decisions. Uh, so we did some more work on the color. Let me tell you a little bit about the color. This is uh, UV reflectance, so we go from what we see at 400, but we can go a little into the UV just to make sure there's no reflection in the UV that we're not seeing. And then we can go all the way up to 700, which is where we stop seeing red, and maybe a little further because some of the um, Pollinators might be able to see beyond that. Most of the pollinators are going to be bees, it turns out, and they're going to be further over here in the UV. That's what a white flower looks like. This is a primarily really high reflectance, uh, above 50% across the um, wavelengths that we see. When you put the paramelanus in there, you'll see there's a dip here. This dip is caused by the absorption of the anthocyanins, the pigments that got the sepals their color, right around 550 to 560, just proving that, yes, there's something quantitatively different about these colors. Nothing different, significantly different in the UV between the two. And then if you look at the dark purple, the darker they are, the more light is absorbed overall and less reflected, but also there's a really nice dip there for those other signs. So the color is quantitative. We now have grown them in greenhouse conditions like you could see up here at some time later, and they are distinctly different. They stay different. We know it's genetic. We want to know whether the pollinators care. So we set up some mixed arrays. These are little lark picks that you get from the florist shop. We set them out in a uh, hybrid zone where the little spot of overlap, so we weren't introducing any genes where they didn't belong. Aaron Tom and an undergraduate set up seven of those cameras for media services that I mentioned last time. And there they are looking at an array each, and then we watched a lot of movies. And 
Um, we watch these movies as the pollinators come in and then move around, and whether they land in the center, whether they land on the outside, and then where they go to. This hexagon with one in the middle is nice because if you land in the middle, then you have equal distance to go to either a pink or a white. I'm going to show you some of the results from this really quickly. So these are the visits that we had. We had some bumblebees. That's Bombus vostasecii, which you heard of repeatedly today. Some honeybees visited, and a couple of flies. But by and large, the majority of the visits were done by bumblebees, and they went to both colors equally, without any statistical difference. A few visits by honeybees and flies. Now, here are the number of visits split out uh, to a new flower. So the first visit that they visit, uh, there was about between 24 and 25 uh, visits to white, and more like 30 to pink, but not significantly different. That's what the array, one of the arrays look like. And so we can look at, for example, if there's a transition. If they start in white, do they stay on white, or do they switch to pink? If they all stay on the same color, that's called flower constancy, and that's a good sign of reproductive isolation. But we see very similar results. In fact, almost the exact same number of visits. If you start on white to go to pink versus you start on white to go to white. Do you see how I got like a white shade going to pink? That's what I'm trying to show you. In case you get, I get lost in these graphs easily. If you start on pink, you have a little bit higher chance of going to white than if you start on pink and staying on pink. Um, but by and large, it's pretty clear that you only need a couple of aberrant visits between the colors to produce enough gene flow too erase species differences, so I'm not at all excited about this being evidence for them being reproductively isolated. All right, I promised you some new data and some really exciting brand new data, and so what we did was we took those sepals, because we have no real strong genetic differences between these things, and we removed the RNA, those are the messages for the genes, because we really want to show that there's something genetically different between these two things. And we then sequenced all those RNAs, and after sequencing all those RNAs, we found 17,694 genes. It takes 17,694 genes to make a sepal. Although a lot of those are probably just barely on. And of those 17,694, here's what the histogram looks like. If you're on this side of the log ratio light to white, if you're on this side of it, you have a lot higher expression, that is the number of genes sequenced, higher expression of light, and if you're over here, you have a lot lower expression of light. And the histogram looks like this, again, this is all the genes, and way out here was a gene responsible for flower color. That's a sugar modifier that stabilizes the flower color. In fact, that's one of the top five genes. It's 77 times higher expression in light than white. That was pretty exciting. There's a couple of genes in the pathway to make flower color, and there they are at 50 or so times higher in the pigmented one than the unpigmented one. These are very consistent results of what you expect, but the first time that it had ever been shown. And here's the most exciting one, which is the regulator that turns these genes on and off. This is like the light switch that turns these genes on and off, and that's where we expect to find the fixed difference between pink and white. A couple others in there. This mid L2 thing, I just peeked, and it is definitely known in Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a pretty close relative in the mustard family, to control the flavonoids, which are flower color synthesizers. There's all the flower color genes, and they all land within the first 700. If you count all those 17,000, uh, within the first 700, you find all the flower color genes being differentially expressed. So, not surprisingly, there are differences in flower colors, and we now know for sure those are coded for by genes, and we now have those genes. So with that, I wanted to just wrap up and thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify that I think we now have the genetic difference between this pink one and this white one. And with those genetic differences, we can then hopefully inform some appropriate taxonomy to know what to save and what to sink. Thank you.